Trumpet of the Swan, Chapter 6, Off to Montana. At the end of summer, the cop gathered his family around him and made an announcement. Children, he began, I have news for you. Summer is drawing to a close. Leaves are turning red, pink, and pale yellow. Soon the leaves will fall. The time has come for us to leave this pond. The time for, has come for us to go. Go, cried all the signets, except Lewis. Certainly, replied their father. You children are old enough to learn the facts of life. And the principal fact of our life right now is this. We can't stay in this marvelous location much longer. Why not, cried all the signets, except Lewis. Because summer is over, said the cob, and it is the way of swans to leave their nesting site at summer's end and travel south to a milder place where the food supply is good. I know that you are all fond of this pretty pond, this marvelous marsh, these greedy shores and restful retreats. You have found life pleasant and amusing here. You have learned to dive and swim underwater. You have enjoyed our daily recreational trips when we formed in line, myself in front swimming gracefully like a lo locomotive, and your charming mother bringing up the rear like a caboose. Day long you have listened and learned. You have avoided the odious otter and the cruel coyote. You have listened to the little owl that says, Ooh, ooh. You have heard the partridge say, Quit, quit. At night you have dropped off to sleep to the sound of frogs, the voices of the night. But these pleasures and pastimes, these adventures, these games and frolics, these beloved sights and sounds must come to an end. All things must come to an end. It is time for us to go. Where will we go? cried all the signets, except Lewis. Where will we go? Caho, caho. Where will we go? Caho, caho. We will fly south to Montana, replied the cob. What is Montana? asked all the signets, except Lewis. What is Montana? Banana, banana? What is Montana? Banana, banana? Montana, said their father, is a state of the Union, and there, in a lovely valley surrounded by high mountains, are the Red Rock Lakes, which nature has designed especially for swans. In these lakes you will find warm water rising from the hidden springs. Here, ice never forms, no matter how cold the nights. In the Red Rock Lakes you will find other trumpeter swans, as well as the lesser waterfowl, the geese and the ducks. There are few enemies, no gunners, plenty of muskrat houses, free grain, games every day. What more can a swan ask in the long, long cold of winter? Lewis listened to this all in amazement. He wanted to ask his father how they would learn to fly and how they would find Montana even after they learned to fly. He began to worry about getting lost, but he wasn't able to ask any questions. He just had to listen. One of his brothers spoke up. Father, he said, you said we would fly south. I don't know how to fly. I've never been up in the air. True, replied the cob, but flying is largely a matter of having the right attitude. Plus, of course, good wing feathers. Flying consists of three parts. First, the takeoff, during which there is a lot of fuss and commotion, a lot of splashing and rapid beating of the wings. Second, the ascent, or gaining of altitude. This requires hard work and fast wing action. Third, the leveling off. The steady, elevated flight, high in the air, wings beating slower now, beating strongly and regularly, carrying us swiftly and surely from zone to zone as we cry, Caho, Caho, with all the earth stretched out far below. It sounds very nice, said the signets, but I'm not sure I can do it. I might get dizzy way up there. If I look down... Don't look down, said his father. Look straight ahead and don't lose your nerve. Besides, swans do not get dizzy. They feel wonderful in the air. They feel exalted. What does exalted mean? asked the signets. It means you will feel strong, glad, firm, high, proud, successful, satisfied, powerful, and elevated, as though you had conquered life and had a high purpose. Lewis listened to all this with great attention. The idea of flying frightened him. I won't be able to say Caho, he thought. I wonder whether a swan can fly if he has no voice and can't say Caho. I think, said the cob, the best plan is for me to demonstrate flying to you. I will make a short exhibition flight while you watch. Observe everything I do. Watch me pump my neck up and down before the takeoff. Watch me test the wind by turning my head this way and that. The takeoff must be into the wind. It's much easier that way. Listen to the noise I make trumpeting. 
Watch how I raise my great wings. See how I beat them furiously, and I rush through the water with my feet going like mad. This frenzy will last for a couple of hundred feet, at which point I will suddenly be airborne, my wings still chopping the air with terrific force, but my feet no longer touching the water. Then watch what I do. Watch how I stretch my long, white, elegant neck out ahead of me until it has reached its full length. Watch how I retract my feet and allow them to stream out behind, full length, until they extend beyond my tail. Hear my cries as I gain the upper air and start trumpeting. See how strong and steady my wing beat has become. Then, watch me bank and turn, set my wings, and glide down. And just as I reach the pond again, watch how I shoot my feet in front of me and use them for the splashdown, as though they were a pair of water skis. Having watched all this... Then you can join me, and your mother too, and we will all make a practice flight together, until you get the hang of it. Then, tomorrow, we will do it again, and instead of returning to the pond, we will head south to Montana. Are you ready for my exhibition flight? Ready, cried all the signets, except Lewis. Very well, here I go, cried the cob. <coughs> As the others watched, he swam downwind to the end of the pond, turned, tested the wind, pumped his neck up and down, trumpeted, and after a great rush of 200 feet, got into the air and began gaining altitude. His long white neck stretched out ahead, his big black feet stretched out behind, his wings had great power. The beat slowed as he settled into sustained flight. All eyes watched. Lewis was more excited than he had ever been. I wonder if I can really do it, he thought. Suppose I fail, then the others will fly away and I will be left all alone on this deserted pond, with winter approaching, with no father, no mother, no sisters, no brothers, and no food to eat when the pond freezes over. I will die of starvation. I'm scared. In a few minutes, the cob glided down out of the sky and skidded to a stop on the pond. They all, che they all cheered. Go, go, beep, 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 beep. All but Lewis. He had to express his approval simply by beating his wings and splashing water in his father's face. All right, said the cob, you've seen how it's done. Follow me and we'll give it a try. Extend your wings to the utmost. Do everything in the proper order. Never forget for a moment that you are swans and therefore excellent flyers, and I'm sure all will be well. They all swam downwind to the end of the pond. They pumped their necks up and down. Lewis pumped his harder than any of the others. They tested the wind by turning their heads this way and that, Suddenly, the cob signaled for the start. There was a tremendous commotion. Wings beating, feet racing, water churned to a froth. And presently, wonder of wonders, there were seven swans in the air. Two pure white ones and five dirty gray ones. The takeoff was accomplished, and they all started gaining altitude. <clears throat> Lewis was the first of the young cygnets to become airborne, ahead of all his brothers and sisters. The minute his feet lifted clear of the water, he knew he could fly. It was a tremendous relief, as well as a splendid sensation. Boy, he said to himself, I never knew flying could be such fun. This is great. This is sensational. This is superb. I feel exalted, and I'm not dizzy. I'll be able to get to Montana with the rest of the family. I may be defective, but at least I can fly. The seven great birds stayed aloft about half an hour then returned to the pond, the cob still in the lead. They all had a drink to celebrate the successful flight. Next day, they were up early. It was a beautiful fall morning with mist rising from the pond and trees shining in all colors. Toward the end of the afternoon, as the sun sank low in the sky, the swans took off from the pond and began their journey to Montana. This way, cried the cob. He swung to his left and straightened out on a southerly course. The others followed, trumpeting as they went. As they passed over the camp where Sam Beaver was, Sam heard them and ran out. He stood watching as, he, as they grew smaller and smaller in the distance and finally disappeared. What was that? asked his father when Sam turned inwards. Swans, replied Sam. They're headed south. We'd better do the same, said Mr. Beaver. I think Shorty will be here tomorrow to take us out. Mr. Beaver lay down on his bunk. What kind of swans were they? he asked. Trumpeter, said Sam. Well, that's funny, said Mr. Beaver. I thought trumpeter swans had quit migrating. 
I thought they spent the whole year on the Red Rock Lakes, where they are protected. Most of them do, replied Sam, but not all of them. It was bedtime. Sam got out his diary, and this is what he wrote. I heard the swans tonight. They are headed south. It must be wonderful to fly at night. I wonder whether I'll ever see one of them again. How does a bird know how to get from where he is to where he wants to be? The end. I love you, sweet dreams, and good night.